Welcome to Suffolk Matters, where all of Suffolk County meets the men and women of Suffolk AME. News, opinions, and insights you won't hear anywhere else. Filling in for AME President Dan Levler, AME Executive Vice President Tom Moran. Good morning, this is Thomas Moran, the Executive Vice President of Suffolk AME, your host for today. In the studio with me is one of our good friends and uh, longtime guest, Assemblyman Joseph DiStefano. Thank you, Tom. It's always a pleasure to come back to the studio and do interviews, uh, especially with the people I like. Well, it seems like I've seen you uh, a lot the last couple of days, uh, many different roles in your assembly role as your AME retiree. I saw you at an event, and I saw you at a fire department event. So uh, uh, you're definitely out there, Joe. Well, I, um, I believe showing you know, the people and the, and the public that I serve that I'm out there doing their work and advocating for them for no matter what the, what the circumstances are. Um, I'm out there in the public, letting them know that whatever they need, that I'm always available to help them in those uh, endeavors that I can help them with. So it's been a few months since your last visit. Uh, last time we spoke, you were leading up to the 2022 budget and some initiatives that you worked on to pass and a variety of the legislative accomplishments. So for our listeners that don't know, let's recap for them. Okay, so one of the biggest things that we worked on this year that was near and dear to me, being a volunteer for as long as I've been, was to help the EMS cost recovery bill become law. Uh, it's been something that's been worked on uh, since the 90s, as far as I can remember. And uh, it came with a lot of bipartisan support, which is how things usually get done, hopefully. Um, but I was glad to be part of that, to help talk to my uh, counterparts on the other side of the aisle to uh, help get us through this uh, process. Um, it was, it was uh, very needed. Uh, we're trying to help uh, our taxpayers. As we know in Suffolk County, our taxpayers are probably one of the hardest tax people on earth. And we're trying to do everything we can to reduce the taxes that our constituents pay. On it. And this would uh, include fire uh, departments being able to bill for EMS services. Uh, we were the only state in the country until this law passed that did not do that. Uh, where insurance companies collect the premiums through everybody's uh, costs to their insurance, uh, we were the only ones that weren't able to recoup that money from the insurance companies. Uh, so that was a big, uh, a big deal for the fire and EMS world uh, to be able to get that bill passed. Sure, and I know how long that's been uh, going on. And to finally get it done, let, now we say that the hard part was getting it done. Right. What's your feedback been from talking to people in the fire service now? Um, and what's the plan going forward? For well, the, the plan going forward is nobody wants to be the first one. That's the plan going forward because obviously when you roll out something new, uh, there's going to be a lot of kinks in it. Um, so they're trying to uh, work out the kinks. Uh, some people are doing it uh, in, in a more scaled back uh, way to get used to it. Uh, some people are hiring companies to do it for them. Some people are hiring within their own fire departments to be able to, to build the insurance companies. Um, ambulance companies have been billing along the way. Uh, you know, the town of Brookhaven has been doing it for motor vehicle accidents and stuff. But um, it's, it's going to be a process. It's, it's going to probably come into full effect next year, 2023, where more people are going to get on board by actually doing it. And with that comes hopefully the uh, cost reduction in uh, the fire and uh, EMS taxes that uh, our constituents pay. Sure, and it's something now, again, it's brand new, and what, what's one of the things that always uh, is a detriment to the fire service is change, right? Yeah. So now they have this Resistant, topic. totally resistant to it. So now they have to move forward. They, you know, this isn't just something that you could sit in a, have somebody sit in an office and send out a bill. This is... This is, involves medical coding, and uh, you know, th again, they're going to have to hire reputable companies or, or find somebody and put them in that position to get this uh, all done. So that so it's done the right way. And, and there are, and I, and honestly speaking, there are a lot of fire departments that have opted out not to do it. Um, they feel that the, the 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 tax burden is fair in their communities that they live in, and they don't want to dis, um, disenfranchise the um, community by saying that they are double dipping um, because they pay for the service in their, um, in their fire taxes and now to go to the, um, to the insurance company as well as paying in the fire taxes, they feel that that's uh, double dipping, which it's really not because it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those things where the insurance companies will pay the expense based on Medicare or Medicaid um, initiatives. So whatever Medicare or Medicaid would pay, that's what they would pay on the transport to the hospital 
Um, so, you know, it's not really double because you already pay for it in your insurance company, in your insurance premiums. You already pay for this service. Yeah. And it's not like you're hitting the person twice. No. It's something that was in the insurance already was already there. was just never really taken Correct. advantage of. Correct. So some of the other stuff we uh, wanted to talk about, you've been laying the groundwork uh, with the county for some new offshore wind projects that will create good paying union jobs in Suffolk County. Do you want to touch on that at all? Yeah. Um, I was uh, given uh, the opportunity last year or this, this current session uh, to introduce a bill along with Senator Alexis Wyke uh, to, um, to introduce the bill to put the windmills out on the, in the Atlantic Ocean and running through my dist- our district at the time. Alexis is moving west. Um, so what happens is, you know, in my opinion, um, we need to start creating ways of finding new energy. Uh, we're ne- I, in my opinion, we're never going to get rid of fossil fuels and all that kind of stuff. It's not going to happen. But we need to also find alternate ways to get energy to our island. Uh, as we all know, our infrastructure is very, very fragile here. Our drinking water and uh, you know, electric is a big part of that. Uh, I am a realist when it comes to things like that because uh, we, we need to really find alternate means of, of new energy to uh, help our electric uh, our grid. Uh, everybody's moving towards the electric cars. Uh, as it stands right now, I don't see that happening by the, uh, the, the date anticipated date of 2035, because as we all know who, who live in Suffolk County, uh, that when we have a bad storm, uh, half, the, half the county gets knocked out of electric and the grid will not support uh, what they're trying to do as far as that goes. But as far as finding alternative energy sources, um, I'm a, oh, and I was very proud to, to and it, it passed both houses. I was just waiting for the governor to sign it. Yeah, as you brought up the uh, electrical vehicles, <clears throat> some of the stuff that we're seeing on uh, the other side of life that we live is uh, they want to bring electrical fire trucks into play. Mm. And uh, that's a little slow getting off the ground. Um, I don't know how that's going to work out, honestly, but I, you know, it, it's the way of the world, it's the way we, we, we're going. Um, when we get there, I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime or not, but uh, yeah, it's, it's something that's being considered. It's something that's being uh, in the process of, of testing and, and those things. Now, an average uh, pumper, as you and I both know, runs close to a million dollars now, depending on how fancy you want to get with it. Um, but the idea of putting an electric is absolutely going to add more cost to it. Uh, and right now, I don't think we should be looking in that direction. I think we're doing okay. But if you want to think about doing something like that in the future. I think it should be optional. It should not be mandatory. Um, you know, when we get to these emissions uh, with some of these fire trucks, they, they're putting so much restrictions on that. Um, but we are going to have to start obviously thinking along those lines of trying to find the renewable energies and vehicles to go with it. And, and again, that's where someone like you comes into play, being able to help um, other elected understand this um, moving forward. You know, they might not realize what a fire truck does cost or that we've already done so much work with emissions on the vehicles and how they're built, safety stuff. So it's good when someone like you is in office and it can kind of bridge that gap. Sure. Kind of what you did with the EMS recovery bill and moving forward, this might be something on the horizon for you that you're going to have to be part of. True. And uh, again, being a sitting commissioner in, the, in Medford Fire District since 1996, um, longest serving in my, in my district. Uh, I just think that it's, you know, I, I just bring like a, an expertise to the field. Um, you know, all the fire trucks since 1996, I've had a, a part of building, uh, and, uh, it, it goes a long way with the understanding and the knowledge of how trucks are put together and what they actually do and the function, the functionality of them. Um, so yeah, I, I could help out in that area. So again, last time you were here, it was April. We've already discussed, uh, the work that is going on. Now that we're into October, November, how do you refocus and shift now uh, as you are up for re-election? And obviously you're out there knocking on doors, and I've seen you out there at different things. So where are you moving right now? The thing is, when when I knock on doors and when I talk to my constituents, uh, a lot of things come up in those discussions. Uh, They ask me, what have I done? What do I plan on doing? What What are my views on certain things? Uh, the thing that hits home mostly now is uh, inflation, which is the number one issue. Public safety is right there with it. Uh, and we, we kind of talk about those you know, kitchen table issues and how we, what we need to do to reduce them, uh, you know, the inflation rate, and how to create the public. I believe, and as I said on this show many times, I believe uh, public safety is a nonpartisan issue. It is something that we all should be worried about. It's something we all should be working towards making better. 
Um, and I think I do that. Uh, the other thing is like bringing projects home. Uh, you know, when I, we, I'm on the transportation committee, uh, we fought real hard bipartisanly to get the Long Island Expressway repaved, which as we know is pretty much almost done at this point. Thank God for that because I, my office was getting inundated with calls about losing tires, losing rims, uh, potholes everywhere. Um, I, was, I was very fortunate to be able to have a voice and having that and, and, you know, give credit where it's due. You know, the governor did give us a little extra money to get it done quicker. Um, but then again, there's incentives for the other side to get it done as soon as possible as well. So uh, the bottom line is uh, fighting for the things that are important, uh, especially those traveling on the expressway. There's other projects going on. When I, I was coming in today, uh, there's, there's uh, state trucks all over on, Sun, on Southern State Parkway uh, getting things done there as well. So we're, we're focusing on the infrastructure that is so uh, fragile, again, in, in our communities. And uh, so I'm working hard with our transportation committee. Actually, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to Albany in a few weeks uh, for a transportation committee hearing. Um, so I bring more of those uh, items into focus because I do have a good working relationship as a member of the transportation committee. Yeah, and since that project started, and uh, obviously we are neighbors, so I know the work that's been done on the expressway, uh, the project oversee the, of all the roads, about how much of that is done at this point, do you, if you know? How much is done? Yeah. I'm going to say 60, 70 percent. I mean, the expressway is almost done. I think there's other, I don't know if the full repave of uh, Sunrise is happening anytime soon, like within this year, but they're, they're working on the parts that need to be done. Uh, and then anything, uh, I'm working on another project on the expressway that uh, goes through exit 68, 69. Um, in the Manville area, the, because you got to remember the asphalt stops at exit 65 and then cement picks up from there. So there's some issues going on with that. There's some, uh, guardrail issues that are not in place on some of these things. So there's, there's still work to be done, but again, being the voice on the transportation committee to help bring the, the money back to, to get that done and the working relationship I do have with transportation, uh, the, the commissioner, uh, we get it done. Um, going just go back a little bit. Uh, one of the accomplishments when I knock on my doors, especially in my own hometown of Medford, uh, is being able to bring uh, a uh, library annex to Medford. Uh, that is something since I was going to school, which was a long, long time ago, where people were very frustrated with the idea of living in Medford and having to go to Patchogue to go to a library. Um, now with the parking issues the way they are and just being inconvenienced and going all the way down there. Uh, I was able to uh, secure land from the town of Brookhaven, and I'm happy to say that they anticipate the opening sometime next year. Uh, the building's going up, so if you're in the Medford area and you're on Horse Block Road by Dairy Queen, uh, you can see the, the progress of the building being done. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of that and, and help bring it to our community, something that was sorely needed for such a long time since I went to school, which was a very long time ago. Um, the other thing that I think was a, was a very important uh, piece of legislation as, as AME is aware of. Uh, we, we worked on this project for a couple of years and uh, to bring the 9-11 bill home uh, and have it signed uh, last 9-11 um, was, was paramount seeing as everybody that knows me knows where I came from as far as what my employment was prior to being an assemblyman, uh, was a public safety dispatcher in the sheriff's office. And I know the, the, the people who do those jobs, uh, you, Tommy, as a, a fire rescue, and the 9-11 operators know what kind of a job that is. And, uh, you know, we just had somebody in fire rescue deliver a baby, uh, on, you know, on from, from Fred's. And those are the things that make it worthwhile. And that's the things that, you know, people don't understand. There's the unsung heroes are the ones who actually take the calls and actually put the calls out uh, and dealing with the community. And 9-11 is, you know, where the first line of defense really is. And, you know, uh, it's, it's awesome to have that feeling that you were able to help somebody before boots on the ground actually get there, you know, whether it's fire, EMS, police, whatever the case may be, those people are actually talking, the, pe uh, the, the people that are calling through that emergency until somebody actually gets there. So kudos to AME and everybody who is part of this. Again, a bipartisan issue. It got passed in both houses unanimously. Won't get into the, the dynamics on how all that happened, but the bottom line is people understand what the 9-11 operators and public safety and emergency dispatchers do and I was so uh, happy to be the one to carry that bill, and obviously uh, it got done. Yeah, and we've we've talked about it before. And it's sort of a, a a job that nobody really thinks about it. Um, they're they're kind of out of out of uh, out of the out of the limelight, out of seeing 
you know, uh, most times we're in basements, depending on what your radio room setup is like. Right. But um, you are that defense. You are that first person, and quite frankly, you're talking to people in the worst time of their life, and, and you're bridging that gap until somebody can actually get there and and help them. I so know. it's much appreciated, uh, especially having someone like you uh, carry this, get this done, able to answer all the questions, which I'm sure you fielded a lot. But from your years of experience. Uh, of doing that type of work uh, made this happen, and uh, it's something we've wanted for a long time, and I congratulate you. And, Thank uh, you. Th we were proud to help and, and move that forward. So just a few weeks ago was the annual Labor Day uh, breakfast fundraiser you've been doing for a while. Uh, this year, uh, Matty Arch. Did I say it right? Arisich. Uh, Arisich. I, can, I knew I was going to screw that up. <laughs> uh, Matty Arisich of the Building and Trucks and Trades Council of Nassau and Suffolk Counties. It was a great day, but why don't we speak about some of uh, how that event went, uh, the people involved with it, and uh, moving that forward. Well, as a, a product of the labor movement, as a product of AME, uh, I learned a lot about how, whether governmental or um, private uh, labor works, uh, and I'm very happy to say that over the years of being in office, I have been able to reach out to the other, you know, being that I come from the governmental part of it, I always am able to reach out to the uh, other side of, uh, we have the, pi uh, the public and the private sector. And, uh, you know, my, my, my job in Albany is to create jobs and opportunities for those that, uh, whether it's union, which is where we want it to be, but sometimes, you know, you just have to f fight the fight uh, just to get more jobs. And whatever that means, uh, we, we always push for the union jobs. Uh, we all know that there's a lot of benefits that come with that. Um, but Maddie has always been a staunch supporter, and I mentioned it at the, the labor breakfast that morning, that uh, the Long Island Building Trades Council was the first endorsement I got when I first ran four years ago. And everybody kind of remembers what their first was, and I will always remember that, uh, that the Long Island Building Trades Council was the first one to give me an endorsement, which means they heard my message, they understood my message, uh, they know I'm always going to fight for labor and creating jobs, uh, and that's where I sit on everything when it comes to labor. Um, you know, a lot of people on my side of the aisle come to me when I'm in Albany, and you know, I remember my first couple of votes that I took. Uh, I was there for like four hours, and they came to me, you're, you're the labor guy. Uh, you know, what, how do you, what do you think about this bill? And I says, well, it's pro-labor. Pro I support labor 100%. Uh, and they said, okay, that's good enough for us. And the same thing with fire and EMS and things like that. Uh, my reputation of where I come from actually uh, catapults me in, in Albany for people who have been there for a while to come to me because they know I have the expertise in those fields to make good calls when it comes to that. So, uh, again, always uh, Matty has been a, a class act. Uh, he, he, he loves his members. He loves his, he loves his constituents. Uh, you know, been to a couple of events with him recently where he is so dynamic when he speaks about what he believes in. Um, so I 100% I, I support whatever initiatives they have with us because um, they are what makes our county work, the, the Long Island work, um, and putting people to work is what is most important uh, to me because if we didn't have that, we'd have people who were sitting home uh, and not being able to benefit uh, from having a job, a good paying job, uh, and we, we need to get away from people sitting home. We need to get them out in the workforce and uh, they find those good paying jobs and we're always there to help them. Now in this climate and all that's been going on, uh, again, you're out, you are seeking re-election, you're out there talking uh, to your constituents. What are some of the things that they're hearing, that you're hearing when you're speaking with them, uh, moving forward, what they would like to see besides these projects that you have already got underway? Well, they, they currently like to know, like, what am I doing to help curb inflation? Uh, obviously, that's a little bit above what I do. That comes from the, like uh, the federal level, basically. But it, it trickles down. Everything that starts up in the federal, it goes down to the states. It comes down to the county. It comes down to the towns. So what we do is we, we advocate uh, for doing whatever we can to reduce uh, the inflation rate. Uh, and that means you know, getting jobs for people to be able to support it. Uh, we, need to, we really need to lower inflation. And uh, public safety, as I mentioned earlier, um, that is the number one issue besides inflation that I hear most about. Uh, and I was the first one to come out in January of 2020 when the, the bail reform was, was first uh, initiated. Um, I worked in the jail for 27 years. 
So I know what it is to, to be in jail and to not uh, be able to get out of jail for a minor offense. Uh, I've seen people come in with $25 bails for a petit larceny charge. Ridiculous. I, those are the types of things where they should get a, a field appearance ticket when they go to court and uh, at a later date show up for court. Uh, but, you know, people, the recidivism of these people that are going uh, in front of judges and uh, being released for the crimes they've been committing over and over and over again is unacceptable. Uh, we need to do a better job of uh, fixing that law or abolishing it altogether and starting from scratch. Uh, last time I mentioned it, uh, New Jersey, it took them three years to create a bail reform law that seems to be working for them. Uh, maybe we should take a, a look at what they're doing and uh, try and uh, emulate that and, and to try and create something similar to that. Uh, because, uh, you know, people getting, you know, the big joke last year was, you know, a bank robber robbed the bank five times and he says, I can't believe they let me out. And he goes and he robs the bank again. Uh, I mean, that's just totally ridiculous. And, and people, an average person seeing that happening and saying, what is wrong with our state? Why are we going through this? You know, why are we not fixing this? Why are we not giving the judges the discretion to keep them in jail if they're going to be repeat offenders? That's a big problem in all of our communities. And we all have a community that experiences that. You know, no matter what area you live in, there's part, there's an area in your district that will have that problem. And we need to fix it. What I wanted to move in was to say some of the things that uh, now you are covering the Tri Hamlet area mm -hmm. that is now part of your uh, district. Mm hmm. And we talked about some of the stuff that you worked on already with the Offshore Wind Project. But I know you're also working very hard down there uh, securing funds for more projects that we should talk about. Okay, so um, one of the things recently, and it's down in the neighborhood road area, um, they, were, they were having a problem on Neighborhood Road where the Mastic Beach Ambulance Company is and where the new library is being built. Uh, I was able to secure some funding for them uh, for crosswalk and lighting. Um, um, again, we have, we have big problems with, uh, you know, the area needs to be, um, we need, we need to show more, uh, initiatives in that, in that area. We want to revitalize it. I'm working close with the town of Brookhaven on that. Uh, we, we're working on projects that we're not, you know, we can't discuss until we get the funding for it. And that's the problem is, you know, getting the funding because, uh, being a minority member of the assembly, um, the resources that you get are a lot different than the majority. So we try to get those funds, and um, the two uh, the two grants that I was able to provide this year, we um, we we gave it to uh, the Brookhaven Museum, the Fire Museum, which is up in Ridge, uh, and we also gave it to the Patrick Medford Library, who's at, uh, who's needing funding uh, to finish the library. But again, the, the the Tri Hamlet area is something that's near and dear to me. I've given them a couple of grants. The ones that I've gotten earlier uh, for the library, we got some uh, funding for them. And, and people would never understand that when you go to a library and you have to take out an internet, those, those Wi-Fis, those portable Wi-Fis, we're able to give them money so that the people that go to the library, because if, if we all see that the internet prices are crazy mm -hmm. uh, and people can't afford it. You know, even in today's climate, they can't afford it. So we were able to give them a grant to be able to take those uh, Wi-Fi portables out for a week or so and then bring them back so that they can be reused by others. Um, but we are anytime we get a grant that applies to whatever they need uh, down in that area, we, we always uh, give it to them if we can. Sure. And, and one of the issues, I know we've had the conversation and uh, AME's had the conversation, Smith Point Bridge, mm -hmm. another project uh, talking about a 50-plus a year old um, bridge uh, operated by our members, uh, our members Cross that bridge that work for the parks department, and plus, the big thing is the people that come here to use the beaches, right, and the marina and all that part that connects down there. Well, actually, that, that was an initiative that uh, started under uh, Legislator Sunderman at the time when that got approved. And I, I to me, the Mastic Beach Shirley area where Smiths Point is, uh, we did invest a million dollars in uh, the state invested a million dollars in knocking down an eyesore that came through. Uh, Hurricane or Superstorm Sandy uh, to revitalize the the beachfront down in the Mastic Beach and Shirley area. Um, they want to um, I, I, the community groups down there want to uh, be able, but they do have flooding issues. That's another issue we have to we have to uh, deal with down in the Mastic Beach uh, yacht club area. Property owners we have we have serious flooding issues down there that we're working on. Uh, we're going to have another meeting in November. But the thing of it is, is that we we got to be able to secure the funding before we move forward with any of these initiatives. Um, but they want to revitalize the Smith Point area 
um, to be able to not only cross it, but to maybe make it more desirable for people. Because it is a jewel. It is a crown jewel of our county uh, to have that area and to have that beach where the, where the campers are fishing. They have great fishing down there. They fish off the pier. Um, and we need to do whatever we can from the state level with the DEC and any of those projects that need to get forwarded done. Again, we need to do that to make sure that people want to come to that area and spend money in the area because it helps everybody when you revitalize uh, an area that's been an eyesore for quite a long time. And that's what we're doing. And we, we take it very seriously and be, being able to invest into that community. I just wanted to comment on you did speaking about um, a former legislator, Sunderman. Um, and as you have taken over uh, that area, uh, I'm sure that there's been times where you have uh, reached out to people uh, to get an idea of uh, issues that you are facing down there. Uh, so you weren't just all bombarded with it once. You're a guy that wants to know everything. Um, so that process, I'm sure, has helped. Uh, I don't know if there is other avenues that you saw, uh, sought out while trying to learn your district as well as learn your your new voters, so to speak. Uh, but, you know, they see the new guy, but they see the new guy as a guy that's already got a lot of stuff done in two terms. Well, the good news about in t uh, inheriting the entire Tri-Hamlet area is I had half of it to start with. So a lot of the people that I, I go to events and I, and I get invited to speak at different uh, clubs and, and uh, organizations is that the people that invite me were probably not one of my constituents back in the day up until this year. So being that I had half of the recognition already in the area the, with the school district, the Chamber of Commerce, civic associations, uh, they already know me. So now just getting them to really connect with what it is that they have that I can help them with, that's where the process goes. Because, again, I had half of it to start with, so I just inherited the other half, uh, which, again, uh, name recognition of somebody who's been there helping the community. Because, again, remember, the school district encompasses everybody in the William Floyd area. So whether it's Mastic Beach, Mastic Shirley, um, they all, so when I help the school district, the other half kind of knows that I was there. Me and uh, Assemblyman Thiel have worked very tirelessly for the school district to get them the funding, and they were very successful in uh, being able to reduce their budget, their school budget this year because of the funding that was allocated to the school districts this year. They got more than they anticipated in most cases. So those are the things, you know, when those big projects come, um, that's when people recognize it, when they see the funding coming from Albany. Again, one of the biggest things that we, we have to get out to the public is we want our fair share. We pay a lot of taxes. We want that money returned uh, so we can better uh, do our communities and the things that are initiatives for them. Uh, and, you know, reducing taxes is, is the paramount thing for Suffolk County and, and Nassau County residents uh, to be able to reduce their, their tax load. Um, so that's what we try to do in, when it comes to governmental uh, spending when it comes to school districts. Joe, it's always great talking to you as we're looking forward now uh, as Election Day comes closer. What can we expect to see um, from Joe DiStefano as we get closer to the election? Well, uh, I'm always I'm always going to advocate for public safety from where I came from. Um, the fire and EMS services, I, I do have a bill that I'm going to be, uh, there's a couple of bills I'm going to be introducing this year. Um, one is, a, a, actually both of them are a redos. Um, we're going to, we're going to try and get the, uh, volunteer firemen and uh, firefighters and EMS services, some pension credits for every year of, uh, for every five years of service to your fire or EMS service. Are you, if you're in the pension system, you can get up to a year of credit up to three. Um, it's, it's similar to the military buyback. Uh, those of you who remember that is you, it's, it's going to be a cost to you as well to buy that time back. And it's not going to be front loaded. It's going to be back loaded. So if, you're, if your retirement is 30 years, you do the 30 years, you're going to get 33 years of service. Um, it does come with cost. And again, recruitment and retention is one of the biggest problems that the fire world and EMS world uh, have. Um, even though it doesn't help everybody, uh, we all know that a lot of the fire and EMS people are, uh, come from the towns, the counties, the state. They all work in some kind of a governmental job. A lot of them do, not all of them do. Uh, but we have LOSAP to help that as well. So th those are, you know, when people say that, they say, well, they do have something. This is just an initiative to try and get people into the system, to get them into volunteer because our volunteer system is really hurting. Um, you know, they, people go on and, you know, uh, mutual aid, automatic mutual aid, uh, where another department is activated at the same time you are because it's hard to get volunteers to come out. Um, marijuana, you know, we haven't talked about that at all. But I'm trying to, uh, me and, and uh, Alexis and I, Senator Wyke and I, have introduced a bill 
to try and exempt the volunteer firemen and EMS, EMS services out of that uh, because we believe it's, it should be under local jurisdiction uh, and the, um, the authority having jurisdiction should be the one that makes the rules for those people because I don't think people in the communities would appreciate somebody coming to their house that's, that's high or whatever. Um, I just think it's, it's something that we need to do. We actually took the bill from Connecticut uh, they have a, a similar thing where the, the volunteer fire and EMS services are exempted from, uh, from that sort of it could fall under the local jurisdiction. Uh, I think that's what people would want. Um, it's something that we need to look at, at least have a conversation about. It. It's going to be a tough bill, no doubt about it. But again, I think people would be more apt to have people coming into their homes uh, to perform emergency services who are not under the influence. So that's, that's another thing. And uh, again, whatever I can do to help the place from where I come from, because as you already know, from the times that we spent together, that uh, Joe DiStefano never forgets from where he came from. And uh, I, I'm still very active in, you know, I, I still go to fires. I still, uh, I'm a lifetime member of the Medford Volunteer Ambulance Company. I haven't been on, I haven't been an EMT in a while, but you know, I'm still a lifetime member and I still try to help my community in that respect uh, by helping the volunteer EMS services. Uh, and public safety, again, is one of the, my primary goals is to, and to try and fix that. So we've learned a lot about you, Joe. We know your candidacy. Uh, how can people get involved to help you out and learn more about you? Well, if you, if you think I'm doing a good job, how's that? And you, and you want to see me continue doing my good job, uh, we have a, a website. It's votejoedestefano.com. Uh, that's someplace where you can find out a lot about what we're doing. Uh, if you have a, um, a governmental question or if you have a, a comment that you'd like me to respond to, we do that every day. Uh, it's team. I'm sorry, it's the Stefano J at Gmail, I'm sorry, at New York State Assembly.gov. That's for a governmental. And uh, just a regular website that you can reach out to me in any other way is, is three of them. It's Team J DeStefano at gmail.com. So vote Joe DeStefano.com, Team J DeStefano at gmail.com, and the Stefano J at New York State Assembly.gov. Plenty of ways to get in touch with you. So my guest has been a great friend, Semiman Joe DeStefano. I think after our talk today, uh, all that you've done between the roads, uh, the wind project, and your fire service, that maybe you should be the earth, wind, and fire assemblyman, <laughs> but uh, might be a campaign slogan for your uh, this like time it. or the next time after. Thank you, Thomas. It's a pleasure always being here. Thank you, Joe. Have a great day, everyone.